Hi, brothers and sisters. My name is Sandra Timko, and welcome to Lumen Christi Live. Um, before we get started this afternoon, I thought it would be most important if we were certainly of like mind. So let's set aside the cares of yesterday and this morning. Um, let's not drag any of the debris into our afternoon. Let's pray. Jesus, forgive Forgive us if we fail to give you this day, even if we walk through the exercise of church. If our minds were not enveloped on your love and your mercy, wash us clean, Lord. Cover the rest of our day in your precious blood. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Um, it's so easy to start the day kind of careless without asking for um, the covering of the precious blood or putting on that full armor of protection. And you can immediately feel the enemy's attacks if you don't cover yourself. Um, today is also one of the uh, Sundays of Advent, and Advent is this haunting, wonderful time of transformation, and that's the subject of this show today. Transformation. No one is beyond being transformed by the Holy Spirit. The Lord loves us all the same. He's no respecter of persons. Um, some people that think they've reached new heights in their spirituality and think that they're that they are at a, a place where maybe they're loved more. No, he loves us all the same. We're all the same in his eyes, and that's wonderful when we consider that um, his mercy is new and fresh every day, and um, all it takes is the asking. All it takes is the asking. Um, I'm with a dear friend of mine, Peter Rosinski, and... Peter, I was uh, introduced to at Northridge Church out in Plymouth about three, maybe four years ago. Yep, probably four years ago. Yep, and uh, I entered into his scripture study class. I was very impressed at his um, knowledge of scripture. He also did a lot of inner healing and um, at the time was even offering theophostics. He has a history of um, charitable works and has spent a lot of time in prison ministry. And we started talking about this whole idea of transformation and this being the time of the year for it. And he has some amazing stories to tell about his time with the um, incarcerated. Um, beautiful stories of transformation. I want to say a couple more things before I introduce him. I wanted to share something that the Lord revealed to me this morning to pass along with everybody. And I just shared it with Peter just moments ago. When I was in first grade, uh, the first conscious effort at making the Advent walk a pronounced one, the um, Holy Spirit showed me the interior of my heart being much like a cave. And the cave was darkened, uh, a lot of straw on the floor, animal poop and whatever. And with each passing day, we were told, prepare your heart, prepare your heart for the coming of Jesus. Clean out those areas of your heart that um, would not be presentable for the king. So every day I would do a self-examination, and he was so wonderful because every day he'd show me that this little light and this little cave in my heart was getting brighter and brighter and brighter until Christmas Eve when the floor was clean and ready for the arrival of Jesus. And even though that sounds childlike, we're supposed to have the faith of a child. We should all approach this time of Advent with this um, excitement that when we meet him at Christmas, we're going to be better people. We're going to be a holier people. That's the whole point. So now, um, Pete. Good to be here, Sandra. <laughs> I didn't mean to go on and on as I did, but the reality is uh, when we talked about transformation earlier, you told me a word the Lord gave you today that was so beautiful. It absolutely stunned me. You said that he wants to, the word was pursue. He wants to pursue us. We have to allow him to pursue us. We have to open up our lives to him. He's always pursuing. He created us to love us. And he pursues us. We couldn't know him unless the Holy Spirit pursued us and told us the truth. The flaw in the plan is we don't always pursue back. You just talked about how you pursued God. Was he there for you when you pursued him? Oh, always, always. Because you pursued him back. And that's the key. In God's eyes, we have infinite worth and value. He created us. He loves us just like we are. He doesn't mete it out according to our worthiness. We're worthy because he created us. You know, we were saying earlier, too, that this is the time of the year where a lot of people that are feeling alone, 
um, even more alienated than the usual time of the year. Self-esteem is waning. And, um, you know, that, that, that time of alienation magnifies your kind of sense of worthlessness. But in God's eyes, everybody has vast worth. You proceeded to tell me a quick story about a woman that you picked up on the side of the road. Could you just share that? So anyone that's out there struggling, feeling he couldn't possibly love me, I've sinned too much. Well, you know, there's no new sins under the sun. And his forgiveness is there to wash as clean as snow. Tell us about this woman. She was incredible. Yeah, if anybody had no worth and value or think they had no worth and value, it would be this woman. I was uh, in Detroit entering about the end of the expressway, and there's a woman standing by the side of the road and had a sign that says, uh, pregnant, need help. And I thought, well, should I give her some money? Should I do this? Well, the light changed, and I had to go on the expressway, and I'm really bothered. You know, she looked like she really needed help. So, you know, and I'm thinking, well, I've got this work to do. Yeah, I've got to support my family. i got my job. And then I finally said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he said to me, if you don't help her, how does the love of Christ dwell in you? Well, that was my answer. Mm-hmm. Pull off the expressway, call my wife, ask you, ask who's a nurse, and ask her where I could take this woman to a rescue mission. And she says, oh, I know the lady that runs a rescue mission right where you're near. I'll call her and have her meet you there. And so we met at that at that rescue mission as a clinic, and the woman was examined. It turned out she wasn't pregnant, but she had a massive infection of hepatitis B, and she was dying. And, of course, she had gotten it through IVU. She was prostitute, you know, did all the wrong things in life. Yet, and uh, she uh, recommend, was recommended to go to the hospital immediately and get treatment, and she, said, and she wouldn't. She said, i got to straighten out the affairs of my life before I die. And so I spent the entire day... <laughs> running her all over Detroit, taking care of her affairs, getting her, her, her affairs in order. And then uh, at the Wayne uh, County building, in the parking lot there, after she had gotten a state ID so she could be admitted to the hospital, she, I presented the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of her salvation, that he died and he was buried and he rose from the dead to cover her sins, to pay the penalty for sins. And she received it. She became a child of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Took her to the hospital, and then uh, we, my son and I waited a couple of hours, and a nurse finally came out of the emergency and said, uh, she's dying, you can't see her because you're not a relative, you just picked her up on the street. But if she's still alive tomorrow, we'll, she'll be in another hospital. Well, my wife found her. She was still alive. She was in Detroit receiving. And I went and visited her. And when I went in the room, the room was darkened, but just a little bit of light, and they had tubes running in and out of her and IVs everywhere. And she was all, her body was just bloated up, blown up like a balloon. Her skin was gray. And uh, she was in a coma. And her, my heart really went out to her. And her hand, her arm was hanging out the side of the bed. So I picked up her hand and I asked God to heal her. Well, nothing happened at that moment. I tucked her hand back in the bed and I left. The next day I came back, she was completely healed. She was sitting up in bed. The bloating was gone. The skin color was back. All the tubes removed except for one IV. And she was sitting there making flowers out of Kleenex. And God transformed her life. If anybody was undeserving before God, she would have been. But God loved her. And, you know, and she confessed to me that the night before that I met her, before I met her, that she had gone to God and said, God, either reveal yourself to me or let me die. And he revealed himself. And how humbling that he would use you as an instrument. Yep. It's, it's amazing stuff, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to be a part of this journey. See, he was pursuing her, no matter how low she got, no matter how bad it got, at the, at the, at the edge of death. Mm-hmm. He was there still seeking her. Mm-hmm. The, the, the rest of the story, as far as I know it, she grew like mad. I continued to visit her in the hospital and in the halfway house afterwards, and I gave her a, a Bible, and she just devoured that Bible. I would visit her, and she, I would start to quote a verse, and she would finish it. You know, and she was telling me, oh, God told me that, that uh, I'm going to get my daughter back. When I get my life straightened out, he's going to work it out so I can get my daughter back and have a family. And, you know, that's my God. That's the God I serve. Yes, and he's there for all of us and for the people that are feeling that they're the unloved or that, again, that they think that their sins are way beyond forgiveness. Don't allow the enemy 
to feed you that lie. Don't buy into it. There is nothing new under the sun. He wants you back. And this is a perfect time to start this Advent um, at a new place in your in your journey with Christ. Today, we talked about a scripture from Jeremiah. Go ahead, give us a One of my favorite scriptures. Okay. Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen. God says, you shall seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. See, that's the, God is always seeking us. If we'll just seek back, he will reveal himself to me. That's been my experience when I was at the low point in my life and, and things weren't going right and my, my, my world was crashing down around me. I knelt down at the back porch of my house and I said, God, I've made a mess out of my life. It's in a bunch of pieces. If you put the pieces back together, I'll do whatever you want. And I meant it with all my heart. And immediately he started giving me direction in life, how to straighten out my marriage, what I needed to do. He started guiding my life. But, but I met my commitment. He knew. He saw my heart. He knew I meant it with all my being. And that was, that was over 35 years ago, Sandra. Now, it's important, though. You said you gave everything over to him. Um, sometimes in a, a moment of grave passion or when somebody is feeling like the bottom's falling out, it's easy to say, okay, I'm giving this over to you, Lord. But when days go by, they start to take back some portions of control. He can't um, work with all of that unless you're willing to release it to him. He'll do it. Yeah. And we need to understand that, you know, there's those moments when you really consider, is my life in that great of a shape? <laughs> That uh, with the way that I ran it, or is it time to see how much better it can be if I'll just surrender the control to him? Just surrender this control. Let him move us where he wants us. Let him bring the people. Let him bring the provisions. It's amazing. Just just release it. What have you got to lose at this point? Uh, Speaking of great losses, you were working among the incarcerated who experience losses like most of us will never understand. Tell us what happened. God really blessed me through it. Uh, uh, from that moment on uh, that uh, I yielded to God, he started changing my life, teaching me. And he, he got me over the last 35 years involved in many different kinds of ministries. This is one that he, that God assigned me to as a prison ministry. And uh, one evening, it's over, over, an hour, over an hour drive away from where I lived, and uh, I got to, to the uh, prison. This is hard for me. It's sometimes hard for me to say because it just reminds me of how good, good God is and he, how good he was to me. Because, see, I'm not any more deserving than anybody else. But the sergeant met me at the gate, and he said, Your wife called. Your son was in a motorcycle accident, and he's got a broken neck, and she wants you to come home. And he says, But come in, you know, call your wife, call home. And I did. And uh, my neighbor was with the kids, and I could hear the kids crying in the background. And he reiterated that the EMS people said he definitely had a broken neck. And, uh, and he's, he's at the hospital, and your wife wants you to come. And so a million thoughts run through my mind. My heart was with my son. I wanted to go home. But I finally said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he said, I gave you a message to speak. Speak it to the men. Then tell them what happened to your son. Boy, it was hard to stay, really hard to stay, but I did. And when I told them what happened to my son, they in mass, these we're talking about murderers, thieves, drug users, drug peddlers, you know, they ran in mass up to me and laid hands on me, started praying for David. And then the ones that couldn't reach in far enough would reach in as far as they could and touch somebody and pray. You know, God had purpose in it, more than healing my son, and we'll get to that, but all the barriers dropped down, the prejudices these men had, the racial barriers, the the denominational barriers, the little petty things that they fight over, they all melted away, and we were in one common accord, the healing of David. This would be a a perfect time because of where you're at in this tender story. Um, Just to take a break for a moment, um, and let our audience hear from 